right, so let's just now say that someone is like, um, first of all, one thing that I didn't mention is this little uh, interesting is a lot of people will uh, actually pick their engine first, okay? And it's a smart thing to do. If you're, if you're not 100% sure about what airplane you want, what, you, what the plane you want the plane to do for you, um, eventually you're going to come to the fact that you, your, your airplane is going to be a compromise. You're not going to have speed and slow. You're gonna have, it's it's going to be lots of compromises uh, building any kind of a kit plane. So you're going to have to narrow down what you want. And it's the same with the engine. Uh, and we find a lot of people that will actually select the engine first because they know the engine is very important. Uh, they decide they want this much horsepower, they want to spend this much money, they want you know this kind of an engine and all that. So we'll get people that will buy a 130 just because they know it will fit in a lot of different kit planes and then they will start looking at what plane to buy around the engine. Um, now uh, this whole discussion about the, the auto conversions are somehow uh, less aircraft worthy than anything else, I think we have to look at the not the past history but the world we live in today. So right now in 2018 uh, we uh, sell engines to mostly light sport airplane uh, people, people that fly those, or uh, slightly bigger airplanes that are still sport type of planes, experimental home built aircraft. So now what are the choices as far as going out there and what you want to fly behind? Okay, you, a little bit bigger airplane you get a Lycoming or a Continental. Those are the traditional ones. Uh, a lot of the kit airframes are not set up for them, uh, even if maybe the manufacturer claimed that it is. If you actually look at the airframe, it was probably derived from a much earlier uh, airframe that used a much smaller engine. Uh, was not designed for the heavy blows of the direct drive Lycomings and Continentals. They might be pop riveted together airplanes and so there's a lot of reasons to to then say, and also uh, some of these airplanes are designed for short takeoff and landing uh, out of your backyard, out of the, your farmer's field, things like that, landing up in the mountains. So now with the direct drive engines, uh, not always, uh, but in some cases the amount of thrust that you get are limited. Um, now you look at other options away from the traditionals and it's what I refer to as the baby Lycomings, which is uh, the engines that were designed with the look of a Lycoming to seem like an airplane engine but that are really just CNC machined or cast parts with automotive or motorcycle guts to them okay like Sony guts in a boombox I remember that joke with that <laughs> guy was trying to sell him one it's got Sony guts man right <laughs> but in any case uh, you know, so you got to look at that, and then, and then of course, the, the 912 Rotax. You know, that is not a big competitor for what we do, in a sense, because the Rotax is a certified engine, and it, it is, you know, most of the people that use it are using it because they have to use it uh, in their store-bought light sport aircraft. You, you have to have a certified engine. Um, but if you do look at that one, it's probably around the world more small sports plane, sport aircraft fly with the Rotax 912 and 914 than any other airplane. So now you look at that engine and you compare it to what we do, auto conversion. Okay, they both have the same RPM, you know, 5400 at takeoff, uh, 4800 in cruise. They're both liquid cooled. Uh, they, uh, I mean, you look at high revving uh, liquid cooled engines. The stuff that everybody said they were going to stay away from uh, in the past. So now that's the most popular. Okay, so uh, it also made it popular because the most diehard people in the field that would never fly behind one like Vance Aircraft with their RV-12 were also forced to use it because it's the only thing light enough, powerful enough, fuel efficient enough to be a contender in today's world. Now you look at that and you say, okay, so if the Rotax 912 is the, the most popular light sport aircraft engine, then how does the automotive engine compare to that? Well, it compares great, except it's better, okay? And I'm not saying the Rotax is bad, I'm just looking at engine technology. The, the Rotax engine is a pushrod engine. The Rotax engine has four individual air-cooled cylinders, okay? Uh, the Rotax engine uses liquid cooling, oil cooling, air cooling, has an external oil tank, tons and tons of external hoses and coolers and, and this and that. And so you look at that and it's like, yeah, you can't really argue with it because it's working and it's a good engine and it's lightweight. 
But then, like we were going to do, we're going to compare that now, the, the, the staple in the industry to the automotive. The automotive, inline four-cylinder engine, basically just one exhaust pipe instead of exhaust pipes all over the engine coming together. One intake manifold instead of intake pipes going all over the engine. Uh, only liquid cool, no air cooling. Um, all the cylinders are in line in one casing, meaning they're all operated on the same temperature. They're not expanding at different rates. Uh, it uses a very nice cam chain, uh, so there's no push rods on the engine. It has variable valve timing and variable valve lift, which sounds, you know, too exotic for airplanes, but it's actually very simple stuff, you know. It, the computer just regulates oil pressure to different ports in the engine, and now you can have lots of extra power and smoothness at all RPM. And it's, they're actually very, very nice engines, and every year they're getting lighter and more fuel efficient because it's not just airplanes that want to be light and fuel efficient, you know, this is going on in cars like crazy right now.